Hey everyone, are you as excited as I am right now? <laughs> I am just bubbling with joy right now because finally I get to assemble my Parmac G5 mod. I did make a few changes to my original design though, but I believe I was able to stick with the essence of the original design. Initially, I had planned on using the MSI B550M Bazooka motherboard because it is in fact my favorite gaming motherboard. However, if you're subscribed to my channel, then you would have seen the video with my Ryzen Sleeper PC that I did for my son. So basically, I used a bazooka to build that machine because he needed a better performing PC right away. Which raises the question, why didn't I just get another bazooka? Okay, let me explain that. If you go back to video number 3 in the series, you'll recall that I messed up a little bit when doing the IO panel spacer. So because of that, I figured that it would be much easier to use a motherboard with the I.O. panel already integrated. That way I would have little or no issues with alignment. The other reason has to do with a change I made regarding the CPU. After reviewing the specs for the PowerMac that I configured on Apple's website in the first video, I realized that I had not selected the right CPU. Now, truth be told, the CPU used in that PowerMac appears to be a special version of the Intel Xeon CPU that is produced by Intel specifically for Apple's PowerMac line. Nevertheless, after doing some research, I was able to figure out which Xeon CPU they modified in order to make that special version for Apple. As a result, I was able to figure out the AMD equivalent. So in order to do an apples to apples comparison, I had to go with the right CPU. So the CPU that will be in the same category turned out to be the AMD Ryzen 7 3800X with 8 cores and 16 threads. As a result of this change, I decided to use a more robust motherboard. Something that has better voltage regulators to handle the increased performance from the higher end Ryzen CPUs like the 3800X. The bazooka's big brother, the mortar, met all the requirements and most importantly, it has IO panel integrated. Another benefit is that it also has a second PCI Express X16 slot. And of course, because the mortar can control RGB memory modules, just like the bazooka, I decided to stick four RGB capable memory modules into the motherboard. I went with four modules because according to the MSI support page for the mortar, four modules would allow me to reach the memory speeds I was looking for while guaranteeing maximum stability. Another major change was to go with a 2TB M.2 SSD instead of the 4TB in my original design. I know this is a major change, but I'll explain why later. The stock Wraith CPU cooler was also not going to cut it, so I got a high performance CPU cooler.
although this was not part of my original design, I decided to utilize the RGB headers and get some RGB lights inside the case. This should look very nice on a case whose entire front face is in effect a huge grill. With the motherboard in, I now focused on the hard drive cage. And the reason why I switched to a 2TB SSD instead of a 4TB SSD. For those of you who do graphics and video editing, you would know that at any given time, you're working on only one project, maybe two. Two terabytes is more than enough to handle the files of an active project. In fact, it's more than enough to store the files for several active projects. So my plan is to keep the footage of all active projects on the SSD. In the drive cage, I'll have two mechanical 4TB hard drives configured in RAID 1 which means that both drives will have the exact same information, constantly replicating each other. So if one fails, the other is there as a backup until I can get the failed drive replaced. This is going to be my long-term storage. Remember that although SSDs are fast, under heavy use they will begin to develop errors after roughly 5 years. A word of advice, if you plan to use mechanical hard drives, before you put the motherboard in, run your SATA, data, and power cables. Otherwise, it can be quite challenging to run them after the fact. Next, I installed the front panel and connected the cables to all the headers. And with that complete, I could now install the graphics card. Now, the Power Mac that I expect in the first video in the series had a Radeon Pro W5700X with 16GB of GDDR6 memory. I could not find that card with 16GB of memory anywhere, which led me to believe that it was also a version specifically manufactured for Apple's Power Mac line. I did plan on getting the 8GB version because although I don't do AutoCAD or anything that would require the workstation driver, the Radeon Pro W5700X uses basically the same hardware as a consumer version of the Radeon 5700 series. In fact, the software allows you to switch back and forth between the workstation driver and the consumer driver. The latter being required for gaming while the former is not compatible with games and is instead optimized for AutoCAD, 3D modeling, and other scientific applications. So rather than spend over $1000 for a video card that's louder, with features that I would never use since I only game and do video editing, I decided to get a consumer grade but powerful video card that would make full use of the PCI Express 4.0 x16 slot. For that reason, I decided to go with the Radeon RX 6700 XT by PowerColor. This card is huge and is the biggest video card I've ever installed in all my years of assembling computers. Having installed all the hardware, it was time for me to take stock of what I had achieved in my first G5 mod and to ask myself if there is anything I would do differently if I were to do another G5 conversion. The first thing I would do different is to use a modular power supply. That way I could cut down on the clutter in the case by using only the cables that I need. Also, 
not everyone would be interested in using mechanical drives, so if you're happy with one or two SSDs on the motherboard, you could remove the drive cages and remove this metal panel right here. Bear in mind that once you remove this metal panel, the tower would not be able to accommodate a full ATX motherboard, but that would require a different motherboard kit, which the Laser Hive also sells. See link in the description below. Also, removing the panel would also allow you to install the hardware required for liquid cooling. In fact, the Laser Hive also sells a kit for mounting the stuff required for liquid cooling. Check out the link in the description below. Also, the cables on the front panel are a bit long and the front panel is kind of expensive. So in my next build, I might just purchase a more generic front panel off eBay or Amazon and then modify it to fit the case. But apart from that, I would not change anything. This is a nice sturdy case and one that's easy to work with if you're willing to put the time in to customize it. The mesh design at the front of the case essentially makes the entire front part of the machine an air intake, but we'll talk about that later. The laser hive kit worked out fabulously, but if I really wanted to play devil's advocate and find a fault, it would be this. It would have been nice to have some type of acrylic or 3D printed space to sit right here between the case and the IO panel. But I also understand why it was not included. I imagine that it would have to be something precision cut and since the location of the screws can vary, it would be best that each person build their own. At any rate, this is at the back of the machine so it's not like people are going to see it. At the same time, it's still wide enough for certain insects and small lizards to squeeze through. I guess a sponge or rubber outline would be appropriate and that way you could drill cavities in the portions that will sit directly above the screws. But now that the hardware is in, let's take the supermodel to the beach for a photo shoot. <laughs> 